Welcome to the Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast, the podcast that travels back in time to review classic episodes of Jim Crockett Promotions Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling as it appears on the NBC Universal streaming service Peacock, as well as internationally on the WWE Network. My name is Mike Sempervivi. If you're out there listening and you want to follow along with me but don't have access to Peacock or the network, you can still do so by heading over to the mighty midatlanticgateway.com and checking out David Taub's reviews of these classic shows. The Mid-Atlantic Championship Podcast has social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search at Mid-Atlantic Pod and look for the logo. We're also available on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash midatlanticpod, where you can find podcasts and other content exclusive to the page. Please subscribe, watch, and like the videos. It would be doing us a great service. And I have a Patreon as well, filled with extras, which you can find at patreon.com slash midatlanticpodcast. In fact, the entire audio bed of today's show, including commercials as they ran that day, are there, as well as special audio documentaries and long-form written pieces on subjects such as Wahoo McDaniel's 1984 heel turn and Team with Tully Blanchard and the history of tag team wrestling in the Carolinas from the 1940s to the 1980s. That's patreon.com slash midatlanticpodcast. Now, with all that out of the way, today, in episode 57, we take a look at the television that was taped on Wednesday, February 23rd, 1983, at the WPCQ Studios, Channel 36 in Charlotte, North Carolina, and began airing in local markets beginning that weekend of Saturday, February 26, 1983. And for many of you, this will be the first time you'll be hearing anything about this show, as to date it has not been uploaded to the WWE Network. But via whoever originally recorded the shows in Richmond, Virginia off WTVR-TV Channel 6 way back when, I'll have some of the audio here for you helping give you context into what was taking place at the time. But before we move on, I'll reset the scene. Last week on the program, we heard the contract signing for the big World Tag Team Championship match coming up on March 12th at the Greensboro Coliseum between Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronoodle and Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood with an added stipulation that if Steamboat and Youngblood didn't win the match, they would have to disband their partnership for good. Also, Sir Oliver Humperdinck cut off some of Jimmy Valiant's hair, which led to the debut of Bugsy McGraw lending the Boogie Woogie Man some backup. Two new managerial forces, Paul Jones and Gary Hart, were moving into prominence as Humperdinck's run in the area would be coming to a close. Ricky Morton debuted on the show, standing out in a tag team match with Dory Funk Jr. and Dick Slater, as well as a singles match with Funk. Unfortunately, we wouldn't get the opportunity to see Morton again in Jim Crockett promotions for a long, long time. Morton would drop matches to the Ninja, a.k.a. Tetsuya Sekigawa, better known to many as Mr. Pogo, and also to Larry Lane, on February 18th and 20th, respectively, before heading back to Tennessee. One month later, on March 19th, Morton and Robert Gibson would make their first appearance on Memphis television as the Rock and Roll Express. And while it was not outright stated during the local interviews that we heard, there's definitely something in the air when it comes to Greg Valentine's relationship with Ric Flair, as well as Mike Rotundo and Jack Briscoe. Speaking of Rotundo, during our tour around the area to find out what happened after last week's show was taped, we found out that he lost the Mid-Atlantic Television title to Dick Slater in Columbia, South Carolina on Sunday, February 20th. So there's where we sit on February 26, 1983. The host of this show's birthday, by the way, I turned seven, And yes, I was watching wrestling that day, but I digress. We begin with action already underway, so who better to introduce what's on the docket than the man himself, Bob Cottle. Hi, wrestling fans, and welcome to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. And as our program begins in the ring, you're watching the U.S. heavyweight champion, Greg Valentine, in action against young Vinny Valentino as the champ backs the youngster into the ropes with a tremendous powerhouse right hand right down across the throat in the chest of Vinny Valentino. What action you're going to be seeing during the next hour? The world tag team champion, Sergeant Slaughter, Don Sinodal, right here. Sweet Brown Sugar in action against Ricky Harris. Also, Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk, Dick Slater. 
many, many outstanding stars. You'll be seeing them all right here during the next hour. So there you heard it. Our referee for all the action today is Stu Schwartz. During the match, Bob notes that the eighth wonder of the world, Andre the Giant, would be making a visit to the area very soon. Unsurprisingly, Greg Valentine, who is the United States champion, didn't need much time to dispose of Vinny Valentino, forcing a submission with the figure four leg lock after setting it up with a spinning toehold in three minutes and 24 seconds of televised action. After the match wrapped up, Valentine joined his buddy Dick Slater at the podium, where the two bragged about their championship success and their list of haters before one of them, Mike Rotundo, came out to take exception. And let's say welcome the new television let's champion, surprise, the NWA surprise, television surprise, champion, surprise, that's Dick right. Slater. One of the most prestigious titles held by the National Wrestling Alliance, held by any professional wrestler. And I didn't, well, I may put it this way, Mike Rotundo is going to say he slipped on a banana peel. But Mike Rotundo, you're a good kid in professional wrestling, but you're just a kid. You don't have the experience that Dick Slater have, and you don't have the savvy and the viciousness that I have when I get in the ring. That's what it takes to be a true professional and a true champion. Greg Valentine, the U.S. heavyweight champion. He didn't get that belt because he got in the ring and played around. When he gets in the ring, he means business. And same with Dick Slater. When I get in the ring, I give 100%. And like I said before, I do not have to cheat like a lot of people say I do. I don't smoke and I don't drink. And I am the athlete that every man, every woman, every person out there on TV land with the TV heavyweight champion looks at and admires day by day, minute by minute, every time you turn the television on, if you saw Dick Slater, what joy, what feeling, what gratitude you'd have all during your day. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, here's the U.S. champ. Valentine. Congratulations, Dick Thank Slater. I'm very, very glad that this man is my partner and I don't have to wrestle. He's a mean, vicious person. He's been around a long time. He knows what he's doing in that ring. That's exactly why he made Mike Rotundo give that belt up. I know Rotundo's going around saying, telling everybody that this man stole that title from him. But that's all false. Just like you got Roddy Piper, Ricky Steamboat, Wahoo McDaniel, Black Jack Mulligan. The list goes on and on of past U.S. heavyweight champions. Bob Cuddle. But I am the greatest of all. Ric Flair was a U.S. heavyweight champion one time. I'll tell you what, I'm going down in the record books as the greatest United States champion of all time, and I'm going to keep this belt for a long, long time. You know, I just enjoy being a champion. So it means a lot of money, and I know Dick Slater enjoys being a champion. You know, you notice today, we don't have Boogie Woogie running out of here and trying to make obscene comments to me. Wait a minute, here we go again. Here we go again. Huh? Let me ask people can see it. You did steal that belt. You and Hart, you had to have your little manager right there. Well, why don't you just get on TV right here tonight? You right be here tonight. Oh, you don't right want to be a fool. That's fine with me. me. But you I'm don't want to be a fool. To be a fool. Huh? I'm willing to take the chance to be a fool. Right, that's fine with me. Just get right in here. Somebody, but I'll wrestle you. You're, you're, right. you're right. That's right. That's right. That's like I said, I am the TV champion, and everybody out there looks at me and looks tonight. up to me. So you, That's fine with me right here. That's it. fine. We'll have a match right here on TV tonight. I'm challenging him. If he wants to put the belt up. That's fine with me. Because he stole that belt. Columbia, South Carolina, him and his manager, Gary Hart. And I'm willing to put my life, I don't care what it takes. If I have to get down and dirty, if I have to get hurt, whatever, I'm going to get that belt back. All right, the challenge for Mike Rotundo to Dick Slater. And we'll be back. We'll have more right after we take this time out. So Mike Rotundo has challenged Dick Slater for later today, very upset, obviously, as well as obvious as Rotundo can make it. He's still getting his feet wet on the microphone. So also revealed that Dick Slater now has Gary Hart in his corner, too. Last week, we heard Hart's thoughts on Rotundo, turning his nose up at Hart's offer to advise him, and it seems like he decided to get some revenge. We also heard Dick Slater say he doesn't drink during that promo, and, well, anyway... After a commercial break, we get World Tag Team Champions Sergeant Slaughter and Don Kernoodle against the future Brutus Beefcake, Dizzy Hogan, and Frank Monty. Monty and Hogan got off to a good start, mostly via the arm drag and subsequent arm locks, but eventually, 
the champions took over and started to grind on their opposition with double teams and mat work. That allowed time for Bob to talk about both the champions and their challengers for March 12th being in training for the upcoming cage match. Hogan was able to make a hot tag to Monty who came in like a house of fire, but Slaughter eventually turned the tables on him, submitting him in 16 minutes and 15 seconds with a Cobra Clutch, a Cobra Clutch that Slaughter refused to break once the match was over. As a result, Private Jim Nelson took it upon himself to make the save, and boy does that tick the sergeant off. Frank Monty, and the referee Stu Schwartz says, ring that bell, let him go. Let it go! He's going to go back for the clutch again. Here's Hogan now, stand into the corner and into the turnbuckle. Sonoda now is all over Hogan. Here comes Jim Nelson in. He's on the top rope and he's going to get slaughtered from the round. And here's Nelson now with a headbutt on Sonoda. Jim Nelson who once was the private of Sergeant Slaughter, Jim Nelson, who a couple of weeks ago came out and admitted that he had been giving some of the secrets of Slaughter and Colonel away, came in and got Slaughter from behind. Hey, where's Sandy Scott? Crockett promotion! I thought you said down blood! And Steve we are supposed to attack us or wrestle us to the 12th of March! Hey, Greensboro! It was Nelson! It wasn't young blood and Steve it was Nelson! It was Nelson! Nelson! All the time at Nelson! Nelson! When he get enough touch to attack me! When? Nelson! You scared with Nelson! It was Nelson! Scrubbing right back him off the rough one! It was Nelson! It was Jim Nelson fans, there's no doubt about that, and you can see right here, watch it in slow motion as you're going to see Nelson now coming in, getting on that top rope, Slaughter's got his back to him, and here comes Nelson off of the rope, right down, and hits Slaughter from behind. Go to war, Miss Agnes. Private Jim Nelson continues to get the advantage over his former teammates, and the mind games continue against Slaughter and Kernoodle. We then went to a commercial break, and when we came back, the bell rang for Sweet Brown Sugar against Big Ricky Harris, the future Black Bart, and this was a real good TV match for the 3 minutes and 23 seconds that it went. Good back and forth with Sugar eventually hitting a dropkick and getting the pin. I wish I could play for you what came up next, but you'd have to see it. And for those of you who follow our social media, you've seen this before. It's the classic music video special of Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood working out to the song Twilight Zone by Golden Earring. Awesome by the standards of 1983 features, the point is being driven home that the challengers are going to be in peak physical condition by the time March 12th in Greensboro rolls around. It was then time for the localized spots, and what a nice change of pace it is having these as opposed to the in lieu of promos from WTVR-TV. Here's Big Bill Ward letting the Denzians of Richmond know what's going on around them. Friends, don't forget to check your local listings for the times of exciting TV wrestling next week. Great card, Hampton Coliseum, Friday, March 11th. A big card at the Washington Lee High School Gym, Montrose, Virginia, Friday, March 4th. Don Canodal, Sergeant Slaughter, Johnny Weaver, Mike Crescendo, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, and others. Great card, Colonial Heights High School Gym. That's coming up from Thursday, March 3rd. Gene Anderson, Red Dog Lane, Don Canodal, Sergeant Slaughter, Private Nelson, Mike George. You'll also see Mike Rotundo, Johnny Weaver, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, and others. Now let me remind you of a super spectacular card, Richmond Coliseum, Friday, March 18th. It will be WRNL Radio Night. Now, the Battle Royal, $5,000 to the winner. And a WRNL Trophy. You're going to see Salva Humperdinck, One Man Gang, and Dick Slater against Ricky Steamboat, Jimmy Valiant, and... Bugsy McGraw. That's going to be exciting six-man tag team action. World title on the line. Rick Flair against Greg Valentine. And right now, we'd like to call on Greg Valentine. That's right. World Heavyweight Championship. March 18th, Richmond Coliseum. Now, I know a lot of you people are wondering why Greg Valentine wants to wrestle Rick Flair. Well, that's pretty obvious. Being the United States Heavyweight Champion, I said I was going to be the greatest one of all time. And I've already achieved that goal. But that makes me the number one contender in the country. Just take a look at any magazine at any 7-Eleven, any convenience store. They'll say, 
Ric Flair, the champion, number one contender, Greg Valentine. Well, let me tell you one thing, Ric Flair. I've beaten you before. I've taken this title off you in the Richmond Coliseum. Well, I can take that World Heavyweight Championship away from you just as easy, so you better watch out, because I'm coming full steam ahead. We told you there's going to be exciting six-man tag team action, and here he is, Sir Oliver Humperdinck. You know, I don't know too much about Bugsy McGraw, but I know one thing. Friday, March 18th, Slater, the gang, and I are going to be stepping in the ring with this Bugsy McGraw, Jimmy Valiant, and Ricky Steamboat. And let me just tell you one thing, Bugsy McGraw. If you think you're going to come here and help Jimmy Valiant hurt me, you got another thing coming. I know about Bugsy McGraw. Bugsy McGraw is as nuts as Valiant. You know, you guys are going to come with a full bore. I know you'll be loaded, my friends, and everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. Bugsy McGraw, we're going to get you too, my friend. We're going to clean all your acts up. A change in the card from what we heard last week. It's now WRNL Radio Night coming up on March 18th in Richmond, featuring a battle royal where the winner gets a check and a trophy. WRNL was a Richmond-based AM radio station, which at the time played older music from the 1950s and 60s. We heard from Greg the Hammer Valentine on his upcoming title match against current ally Ric Flair, as well as Sir Oliver Humperdinck and Dick Slater, who also had the one-man gang by their side, discussing Jimmy Valiant and Bugsy McGraw. It was then time for Jack Briscoe against Red Dog Larry Lane, one of the Funk family's most trusted hands. As a reminder, it is Dory Funk Jr. who's overseeing all of the booking for Jim Crockett promotions, although many hands remain in the mix on a local level, most notably Johnny Weaver, who has a portion of several towns, and serves as the overall booker for Frank Tunney's Maple Leaf Wrestling out of Toronto. The match barely gets started when Paul Jones stormed the set to take umbrage with Gerald Briscoe's appearance on commentary. And Jerry, I tell you, I know it always gives you a little different thrill when your brother's up there in the ring and you're out here watching him in action. Well, it sure, it sure does, Bob, but you know, I've watched him for many years all through college. All through high school, and uh, there's Paul Jones out here. Paul Jones just walking out, and uh, I don't know. I don't know what Paul up, Jerry Briscoe. If you come out here to learn something, you're watching the wrong man. If you're watching your brother, you are to watch Story Funk. He's the champion. You can learn something from champions. Speaking of champions, Jack Briscoe is a two-time world champion, two-time NCAA champion, three-time Oklahoma high school state champion four-time junior high school champion, only lost two matches in his career, like had a record of 150 wins with two losses and about 10 national championships and two world championships. Mr. Jones, if you can't learn a lesson from that, you can't see. Yeah, and he couldn't buy enough gas to get him from here to Gastonia on it either. That's right, he's too busy buying orange groves. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Well, listen, I didn't come out here to be insulted or insult you or your brother. I came out here to add a little class to this program. A great exchange there and a tremendous checkmate with a line about orange groves. As Briscoe and Lane went at it, during the match, Jerry Briscoe touted his brother's amateur record and claimed that a few years ago, his brother and Lane had met during the NCAA National Wrestling Finals in Laramie, Wyoming, with Briscoe pinning him. And guess what? That's true. 1965, the year Briscoe won the national championship at 191 pounds for Oklahoma State, he pinned Lane went to Northern Colorado in the second round. Jerry would also use his time to make fun of Jones for needing Funk to defeat Jack, as old number one couldn't get it done himself. The battle that was in the ring would come to an end somewhat abruptly as Jack reversed a takedown attempt from Lane and reversed it into a Fez Press-style cover for the victory in four minutes and seven seconds. Solid bout spent almost entirely on the mat. After the match, Jack would stare a hole through Jones, and the show went to break. Coming back, Slaughter and Kernoodle had more to say about Jim Nelson, Paul Jones had more to say about Jack Briscoe, and Sir Oliver Humperdinck made his first appearance on the show proper to say more about Valiant McGraw. After the trio of heels got done, the show went to break again. Hello, I'm B.J. Thomas, and believe me, there's more than raindrops falling on my head these days. Some of the corniest jokes I've ever heard have been falling all around me this week because I'm visiting with the shameless comics on the Hee Haw Show. But you know those pretty girls make up for the corny guys. <laughs> Not to mention the pretty music. So join me on the Hee Haw Show this week. See for yourself. Hee Haw, Saturdays at 7, here on WTDR TV 6. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. 
The next scene we'd see would be Bill Ward introducing us to the top champions in the territory and arguably the world, world champion Ric Flair and United States champion Greg Valentine. Although it's not expressly said on the show itself, as many area fans already knew, matches between the two had already been booked, which leads into Ward's local promotion for Richmond on March 18th. Here's the segment in its entirety. If you have wrestling books, you'll notice the champions listed, United States heavyweight champion Greg Valentine, world's heavyweight champion Ric Flair. Both these gentlemen are the two top wrestlers in the world today. They've worked hard for that honor, and they are very reluctant to give up those titles. United States heavyweight champion Greg Valentine, world's champion Ric Flair. Let's call him in right now. Ric? Well, Bill, this is kind of a complicated item we're talking about today. We're talking about the world heavyweight championship. We're talking about the U.S. heavyweight championship. We're talking about two men that have been friends over the years, two men that have been partners, two men that have accomplished just about everything there is to accomplish in professional wrestling. But business is business. And although I have all the respect in the world for Greg Valentine, he's probably recognized as the greatest U.S. champion of all time. He's held the title and he's defeated every top contender that's come his way. Likewise, I won the World Heavyweight Championship and I've defeated every top contender that's come my way. Now Greg Valentine is ranked at number one. Number one in line for a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship. And the people out there are calling... They're clamoring, they're knocking at the door, the pr promoters, they want the match. But Valentine and I are out here, aware of what's about to happen in the future, and aware of the fact that we're going to have to get in that ring, and we're going to have to decide between the two of us just who the better man is. Uh, Greg, I have a lot of respect for you, you know that. We've been round and round. We've done just about all there is to do in professional wrestling. So when you and I get in that ring, Greg, I want you to know... It'll be for the World Heavyweight Championship. I made the best man win. Well, thank you, Rick. You know, I have a lot of respect and admiration more than anybody else in professional wrestling for Ric Flair. I've been his partner. We've been world tag team champions together. He just uh, said a mouthful when he said that I was the greatest United States champion of all time because he was once United States champion. But I, I want to say one thing. I think Ric Flair has achieved goals beyond expectation. He is Harley Race is the world champion. Terry Funk has been a world champion. Dory Funk Jr., Jack Briscoe. I think Ric Flair has been a better world champion than all four of those champions put together. But if it came right down to it, you know, the ultimate goal of every professional wrestler is to become a world champion. I want to be the world champion. I don't want to wrestle Ric Flair, my friend. But if I had to, I would wrestle Ric Flair and I would use everything possible to try and win and take that belt that Ric Flair's got around his waist right now. That's the way it is and the way it must be. And fans, that would really be something. What a great, great match that would be. Let's take time for this commercial message about the Mid-Atlantic Wrestling events coming up in your area. Fans, check local listings for the times of Action Pack Wrestling next week on TV. A great card at the Hampton Coliseum on Friday, March 11th. Big card, Washington Ali High School Gym, Montrose, Virginia, on Friday, March the 4th. You'll see Don Canoto, Sergeant Slaughter, Johnny Weaver. You'll see Mike Rotundo, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, and others. Great card, Colonial Heights High School Gym, Thursday, March 3rd. You're going to see Gene Anderson, Red Dog Lane, Don Canoto, Sergeant Slaughter, Private Nelson, Mike Rotundo, jo Mike George, Johnny Weaver, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, and others. Super spectacular card, Richmond Coliseum, Friday, March 18th, it will be WRNL Radio Night with a battle royal, $5,000 to the winner, plus the WRNL trophy. You're going to see Sir Oliver Hoppadink, the one-man gang, and Dick Slater against Ricky Steamboat, Jimmy Valiant, Bugsy McGraw, world title Rick Flair against Greg Valentine. Here is Ricky Steamboat. Well, everybody knows for the past several months now what's been coming down between the house of Humperdinck and Mr. Jimmy Valiant. Everybody that he's been throwing up in front of Jimmy Valiant, Jimmy Valiant's been getting rid of. But now there's a six-man tag team combination. They've been ganging up on this particular individual, cutting his hair. One-man gang, Humperdinck and Dick Slater. Myself, Jimmy the Boogie Woogie Man Valiant, 
and Mr. Bugsy McGraw in a six-man combination. Well, let me let him tell you how it is. So, you got that right, Ricky. People, brothers, sisters, I got the craziest dude on the street. Bugsy. I mean, Bugsy, crazy Bugsy, Bugsy. Puppety, one man gang, Slater, you cut my hair. But that's war, you're Mark men. Pound for pound, this is the toughest dude I know, Ricky Steamboat. And I got Ricky and my brother, Bugsy, 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 and we're coming at you. Treatment. Look out, look out. Well, bring it on, my friend. You think we're stupid? You think we signed contracts thinking we're going to get in the ring and get our brains beat in? No. We're coming loaded for bear. 450 pounds and Humperdinck when he puts on a pair of tights is a lethal weapon, my friend. And Bugsy McGraw, you may be a street brother, but I don't care because you got to do a lot to beat me down and a lot to beat Humperdinck down. And in Richmond, we're going to see just how brave you gentlemen are because we are not stupid and we are going to take care of business in the way we know how it does. That's a win. As you heard, Flair and Valentine are on the collision course, and as of now, detente still exists. We also heard from Ricky Steamboat and the Boogie Woogie Man Jimmy Valiant. But we didn't hear anything about Jack Briscoe against Mike Rotundo, which was advertised last week. Now that Rotundo is no longer the TV champion, the match was scrapped. But something tells me that the nasty streak that Briscoe displayed during the pair's promo last week may widen as 1983 moves on. It's now time for our main event, a rematch for the Mid-Atlantic Television title. Dick Slater, Mike Rotundo. Gary Hart joined Bob for commentary, which, as we came back from break, led to an exchange between Hart and Rotundo, who was still ticked off that Hart's interference cost him the title in Columbia. The difference between Gary Hart on the microphone and any other manager is so stark when it comes to getting a program or individuals over. He was fantastic here. He and Bob discussed Andre the Giant coming into the area and taking on the $5,000 body slam challenge of the one-man gang, as well as riling up the fans, the impending debut of the great Kabuki, and the situation between Rotundo and Slater. Slater jumped Rotundo as he stepped into the ring and held the advantage early using roughhouse tactics. Rotundo was able to turn the tables once the action turned back scientific. At the three and a half minute mark, Rotundo caught Slater in the airplane spin, but Slater got his foot on the ropes. Rotundo then sent Slater into the corner, but was met with a knee as he charged in, and the champion rolled him up for the pin at four minutes and nine seconds. What we didn't see was if Slater had a handful of Rotundo's trunks or not. Rotundo said he did, as we'll hear during our show closing trio of babyface promos. That was Slater! Last week. That's right, Daddy! Shut up! Slater! You're a Mark man! Valentine! You're Mark! Hop a dink and one man gang! Listen at me! Slater! You got that TV title! It don't belong to you! It belongs to the people! When I beat Ivan Koloff, I gave it to the people! That's the people's belt! Valentine! I'm gonna get you where it hurts you! You say you're the greatest! The greatest champion of all time! Well, you're not! And I'm gonna take that belt! One more thing! Mr. Mr. One Man Gang, you had the scissors, you cut my hair, and I'm going to cut your hair. You're going to be completely bald. And now, now, Mr. Humperdinck, Humperdinck, I want one match with you. A no loser leave town. He's challenging me, I'm challenging you. Loser leave town. This is my street brother. This is my street brother. We grew up together. We grew up together. We're in the same gang. The same crowd. Together. Street brother. Yeah, I'm about this. What we really got here, brother, just a few words about this. What we got at this is the word is freedom, you understand? Freedom. And when freedom comes so easy, and we take it for granted, brother, you understand? Taking freedom for granted, we sometimes lose sight of the fact that we got to fight for it. We got to stand up and say who we are and what we are. And I'm standing right by my man, the Boogie Woogie Man, and we're going to get down. It's going to be called declared war. All right, and right here, Mike yeah, Rotundo, Mike. That's an example of what I'm up against right now, but... This slate has got to pull my tights. I don't know if you saw it or not. He's got to pull my tights. We didn't win. have a good look at I don't care. I'm not, it doesn't it matter. That's one match, Slater. But I'm coming after you, and I'm going to have that belt around me again. All right, Mike Rotundo right there. Rick you know, Steve everybody knows our quest. March the 12th for the World Tag Team Championships against Sergeant Slaughter and Don Canoodle. 
Everybody saw what kind of training that we're doing right now. We're real serious about this. We got that one condition that they put upon us. If we don't win this match, this tag team is dissolved. We've been working out real hard in training and talking about working out. This man over here has been showing us how to work out with the Cobra Clutch. Oh, and, and, work out and slaughter our money. I just wanted to prove to you and Dr. Noah that I'm not scared of you. I've never been scared of you, and I'm coming for you. You want this hat? Come on and get it. I'll tell you what, these guys are ready, and they're going to take those belts. Cobra Clutch! Slaughter. You're going to find out why I'm the sergeant slaughter, and you're the private. There you go. And with that, we close the door on the February 26th edition of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Two weeks away, Saturday, March 12th in Greensboro, the final conflict comes to a head. As always, after Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, Worldwide Wrestling was taped, and here's what viewers of that show would see. Welcome to Worldwide Wrestling, the very best in wrestling. John, we've got a study program for him. According to the Clawmaster Jim Zordani's archives, which were populated by gentlemen like David Baker and many others, it looks like it was a busy day on the show. Results listed that didn't take place on Mid-Atlantic are that U.S. champion Greg Valentine defeated Dizzy Hogan, Dick Slater topped Ron Rossi, Sweet Brown Sugar beat Ken Timms, The Briscoes down Masafuchi and Ricky Harris, Dory Funk Jr. knocked off Bill White, One Man Gang beat Vinny Valentino, and Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronoodle defeated Ben Alexander and Frank Monty. No word on whether Monty received the same treatment from the Sarge. Now, let's take a look around the area and see what this upcoming week will bring. Let's take time for this commercial message about the Mid-Atlantic Wrestling events coming up in your area. We begin one day after the television was taped on Thursday, February 24th at Harrisonburg High School in Harrisonburg, Virginia. On that show, Jimmy Valiant faced the one-man gang while Jack Briscoe battled Dory Funk Jr. Friday, February 25th at County Hall in Charleston, Ricky Steamboat beat Dick Slayer, Sweet Brown Sugar beat Dory Funk Jr. by DQ, and Jay Youngblood beat the Ninja. Saturday, February 26th, Spartanburg's Memorial Auditorium, Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronoodle beat Mike Rotundo and Jerry Briscoe, and Jimmy Valiant beat the one-man gang in a New York street fight. On Sunday in Asheville, North Carolina at the Civic Center, Dory Funk Jr. faced Jack Briscoe, Jimmy Valiant took on Sir Oliver Humperdinck, and Dizzy Hogan and Tommy Gilbert teamed to battle Bill White and Ricky Harris. Meanwhile, the same day at the Winston-Salem Memorial Coliseum, Johnny Weaver and Private Nelson defeated Gene Anderson and Larry Lane, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood beat Dick Slater and the One Man Gang, and Sergeant Slaughter and Don Cronoodle knocked off Mike Rotundo and Jerry Briscoe. Monday, February 28th at the Greenville Memorial Auditorium, Dory Funk Jr. beat Mike Rotundo, the One Man Gang topped Johnny Weaver, Gene Anderson and Larry Lane beat Dizzy Hogan and Mike George, and U.S. Champion Greg Valentine defeated Jimmy Valiant in a match where Roddy Piper served as the special guest referee. And on Tuesday, March 1st, in Columbia, South Carolina, at Township Auditorium, Gene Anderson and Larry Lane beat Tom Pritchard, who was the substitute for Chick Donovan, and his partner Joe Lightfoot, both making the trip north from Atlanta. Also making the trip north were the Moondogs, who lost to Sweet Brown Sugar and Dizzy Hogan. Dory Funk Jr. beat Jack Briscoe, and Jimmy Valiant beat U.S. Champion Greg Valentine by disqualification. And that takes us back around to the WPCQ studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, for the tapings that took place on Wednesday, March 2nd, 1983. Here's where I would give you the official WWE Network preview of next week's show, but as you know, there isn't one, as the network is bereft of the episodes. And unfortunately, I don't have it either. But that's okay. It just means when we review the next episode of the show, the weekend of March 12th, 1983 will be upon us. And everything that takes place around the circuit between March 2nd and March 11th will catch up on as we reach the final conflict. As I mentioned earlier on, I invite you to follow us across our many forms of social media. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Just search at MidAtlanticPod. I would also really appreciate you following the show on YouTube youtube.com slash midatlanticpod, and please consider supporting the show via Patreon. Just search patreon.com slash midatlanticpodcast. I also invite you to support all of the programs and content here on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We don't condescend, and we are dedicated to preserving and accurately archiving the history of professional wrestling. 
and I'm proud that this show, produced by me, can be a part of that. I'm Mike Sempervivi. Take us home, Bob DeBartleben and Uncle Bob Cottle. We'll see you next week. And until then, so long for now. Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling has been furnished to this station for broadcast at this time by Jim Crockett Promotions in exchange for commercial consideration.